No, it's just a game. Although... A game of magic represents a duel between wizards. The goal is to reduce your opponent's life to zero, to kill them. The main way to do so is by commanding creatures to attack them and each other. And all these game actions are portrayed in art, highlighting the use of force. Clearly the game has violent elements, and yet it feels wrong to call a card game violent. After all, the players in these promotional materials are just having fun, right? That ambiguity is what this video is about. Today's topic isn't just, is magic violent? It's the question, is magic violent itself? What makes some media more or less violent? Why do people make violent content in the first place? And what does that mean for players who play with violence? As we get into it, please keep your anguished cries to a minimum, because it's time to search your library. As usual, let's start with the definition. Violence is the use or portrayal of harm against another being. This is intentionally vague as people's perceptions of violence vary but that variance can say a lot about a culture or time. Before we get into that, I'm going to reject a bad conclusion. That magic, or any other media, causes aggression. This causality has been debated for millennia. Plato wrote about how dramas were ruining the minds of Greek youth. Today, we know that link is tenuous. The real answer is that it's complicated, multidimensional, and impossible to study in a controlled way. Someone may watch a horror film, then commit a crime. But they've also seen plenty of other media, and their own life may have multiple other stressors or mitigators. So let's start with a more traceable origin. Where did magic get its violence? Magic the Gathering was designed in 1993 by Richard Garfield. Garfield relied on a fantasy backdrop that was strongly influenced by D&D, a medieval-ish world of swords, sorcery, and monsters. This is the first reason that magic feels less violent than a shooter. Obviously, dragons aren't real, but even the realistic aspects like medieval weaponry are unlike today's dangers. This is referred to as psychological distance, the degree to which people are unaffected by unfamiliar phenomena. For a long time, magic avoided portraying modern firearms. When they do appear, they're outdated, magical, or futuristic. This distance depends on cultural context. For example, portrayals of demons were considered harmful during the Satanic Panic of the 1990s. Wizards responded by removing these portrayals until 2002. More recently, Wizards has apologized for cards that could be interpreted as sexual or racial violence, as people have introspected more on the harm these cause. Even today, most media undergoes some content control like the MPA or ESRB. But board games don't typically have ratings based on content. The suggested 13 plus range is mostly about play complexity. This relates to another source of psychological distance. Obviously, magic can't teach you how to control lightning, but it also can't teach sword fighting. Art displays static images, and damage systems are extremely abstracted. The same is true for most board games. They can't teach harm. This is why it's just a card game. Compare that to the outrage about the 1976 video game Death Race. It looks laughable next to horror movies, even from that same year. But Death Race gave you the steering wheel, sparking the earliest fears about video games and violence. I'd like to highlight a third factor contributing to distance, although it works somewhat paradoxically. 
In D&D, you typically only control a single character. Violence that characters commit feels personal. This was a purposeful design choice. D&D was meant to be more character-centric than the war games that inspired it. But magic is closer to those war games. You lead an army of soldiers, or beasts, or brushwags. In terms of lives lost, a game of magic can be significantly deadlier than a D&D campaign. This is called scope insensitivity. It's the concept behind the quote, a single death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. We struggle to empathize with large-scale death in games or reality. According to games writer Stuart Woods, this has to do with the culture that birthed wargaming. In post-World War II America, wargames were associated with our victory in contrast to the more peaceful Euro games that appealed to war-tired Europe. Okay, time for the 3-3 creature token in the room, the violent visuals of magic. When people talk about violence in games, they're usually referring to visual portrayals of gore. More gore, more violent. Especially in board games, phrases like deal for damage feel sterile, so art has to do the heavy lifting for theming. Magic's art serves as another limiter on our perception of harm. Unlike the examples from the introduction, most of the violence in magic art is implied. You see a woman swinging a sword or blasting a flame off screen instead of the aftermath. Their picture is taken moments before disaster, like a Far Side comic. Lead designer Mark Rosewater has spoken about the as fan of a mechanic. When you open a booster, you should see the appropriate number of synergistic cards in order to build a deck. On the other hand, the opposite is true of gore. Even in Innistrad, a set based on horror, I only counted 10 cards that explicitly show gore. In a given game of Limited, you may only see one or two of them, meaning that you only focus on them for a short while. To my knowledge, there isn't a lot of scholarly work about violent visuals specifically in board games, so a lot of this is my own theorizing. I look forward to seeing new research in the field. So now we've established that magic is violent, but for various psychological reasons, appears less so than other media. The next question to ask is, why bother making a game violent in the first place? The most obvious? Violence sells. Violence automatically raises the stakes of media. A game's theme is a story, and stories need conflict. Violence is a simple way to make us care about a conflict. Nearly every magic set involves a war between two or more factions, which players simulate. Sociobiology is a field concerned with identifying biological explanations for human behavior. One of its theories is that we are psychologically drawn to portrayals of violence because we want to learn how to avoid or triumph in similar scenarios. As evidence, there is a long history between games and violence. Chess and Go simulate warfare, and play between animal cubs often takes the form of mock fighting. The aforementioned age ratings are warnings, but in this view, they're also advertising. Children and teens often seek out this content to prove their maturity. Despite the common phrase, violence in media is rarely senseless. Margaret Bruder introduced the concept of aestheticization the way stylized violence creates conventions and themes. One of the defining aspects of magic is its color pie. Aesthetic violence is key to that definition. Red uses fire and lightning. Black uses disease or acid and is often implied to be crueler. White is interesting in that its violence is often portrayed more positively justice against attackers, or painless oblivion. The aesthetics of violence also distinguish different settings. In sets where white represents oppressive hierarchy, it is depicted harsher. 
Also, most of the worlds in modern magic are homages to other cultural media. To do so, magic replicates their aestheticization. In a Godzilla-inspired world, we might focus on the majesty of a monster, but in a horror-themed one, we linger on the suffering of victims. At the same time, magic also breaks existing norms in media in order to better represent its diverse player base. Historically, when stories are defined by violence, they play into gendered tropes. But in modern magic, women and queer characters are equally capable of inflicting damage. So in summary, violence has clear value to magic's designers as a world-building tool. But this choice does alienate some potential fans. A few years ago, I taught my partner how to play Magic the Gathering. She picked up on the rules quickly, but wasn't a fan of the theme. We ended up switching to Dominion, a game similar to Drafted Magic, albeit themed around empire building. Of course, there are many women who enjoy magic and other violent games. But in a culture that socializes girls and women away from violent hobbies, that theme may limit appeal. More generally, people who have experienced physical abuse themselves may choose a different game. Which leads to one last question. Could there be magic without violence? Players have always loved alternative win conditions. The most common are still adjacent to physical violence. Milling is themed around causing insanity, while Infect is about poison. But others celebrate things like survival, happiness, um, rock collecting. Still, these typically only appear once a set. Designers assume that too many alt wins will dilute key elements of gameplay, probably correctly. Furthermore, it risks the flavor of magic. As I mentioned before, violence naturally raises the stakes of a conflict. To step back from that could make a set look less serious. The only clearly non-violent set, Unfinity, is themed around a space circus. Damage is connected to post-ride sickness and bad concessions. On one hand, it's an unset, a joke set meant to parody normal magic. But on the other, unsets are often testing grounds for concepts that transition into standard sets. One of the things that keeps us coming back to magic is the variety of themes. There's no other game where an eldritch monstrosity can fight an army of Mayan gnomes. But violence isn't the only language of games. Other game systems, like Disney's Lorcana, are intentionally designed with less reference to harm. As magic evolves, its designers could explore worlds where combat and damage have totally different meanings. I'm not pushing for the removal of violence in magic. And for the last time, we can't know if games cause aggression. But as I've hopefully shown, the decision to play with violence is not free. It is influenced by our shared histories. It influences who we see at our tables. Despite that, and sometimes because of it, it is fun. There's obviously a lot more to this topic. The dynamics of sacrifice or the portrayals of violence against specific cultures. But I hope this video gets you thinking more about our role as players, in magic, and beyond. Speaking of, how violent does magic feel to you, and do you think the game could ever change? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe, your support is very appreciated. This episode was highly influenced by Graphic Violence by Dr. Emily Edwards. It is a great read for those interested in the dynamics of modern media, news, movies, and games. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.